Well, hi, I'm Adrian Warnock, and I'm here with Professor Peter Hillman. Uh, this is now the second uh, interview that we filmed together. And uh, to this particular interview, we talked a lot about the background, really, of um, particularly CLL and how it's sort of developed uh, in terms of treatment and what the journey is like for a patient uh, from diagnosis to watch and wait to sort of treatment, and also a little bit of where we might go in the future in terms of new treatments and new combinations. So it was a really helpful sort of journey. Uh, but I guess there's a bunch of questions that I'm sure many of us have got um, for a top blood cancer doctor. And, and I guess um, with, with Peter's uh, permission, we'll probably talk more broadly about blood cancer in this particular segment, because I guess we don't know much about the specific different indications. And certainly the government has, have in the UK labelled all blood cancer patients as being high risk. And uh, um, some of the data, uh, particularly the way the Blood Cancer UK charity had al analysed that data, or reported on that data rather, they didn't analyse it, um, suggest that maybe even blood cancer patients as a group are the highest risk, um, other than perhaps um, all solid organ transplant donors. So this is causing great anxiety. And I, I'm, I'm thinking a little bit about the sort of patient we were describing, uh, Peter, or you were describing in the first segment, when you talked about someone who, you know, might almost have found out about their blood cancer, either of CLL or another slow growing cancer, almost by accident and been told it's okay, you know, you don't need treatment, go away, work, live your life, go on holiday, uh, you've got a job, you may be married, your wife or husband might be a key worker, a doctor, or in my case, an occupational therapist. Uh, you might have kids at school, um, and you might not have very many symptoms. Maybe you've got a little bit of fatigue we talked about, or maybe you don't really have too much of anything. Maybe you get the odd cold, or maybe, you know, you don't even feel that your immunity is that bad. And then all of a sudden, you know, politicians come on the screen and say, you will not leave your house. You are under lock and key. You are under house arrest. What has that been like for the patients you've spoken to? And how do you feel about that as a blood cancer doctor and trying to help people through that? What advice would you have for us? I think it's been a, a real challenge for everybody, not, not just patients. I mean, the lockdown, you know, the, uh, some people have dealt with it well. The people struggle with the whole, the whole isolation. It depends on your social situation as well and your, your life situation you know so some people live you know, near outside space that they can easily go on to others are stuck in a you know in a much limited more limited place so so i think that's a problem generally um i think in terms of uh the our um our patients if you like the hematology patients the the, the there's we know first of all for CLL that the infection is an issue this is a disease of the, of the immune system um, not every patient with CLL will get infections, but we know there's a higher risk of getting infections if you have CLL, uh, particularly if you've had treatment. I mean, the stage A patients are like, it's slightly more difficult to know exactly what the risk is, but somebody who's on treatment or has recently had treatment is clearly, clearly at greater risk um, of any infection. So, and then if you look at the COVID situation, we're starting to get more information specifically about COVID, that um, there was a very recent paper which showed with, with a large number of the population in the UK that showed that hematological malignancy was, was an important um, risk factor for, for severity of, of, um, of COVID-19 mm. infection. So, so, you know, with a four times the risk of dying if, they, if those mm. individuals got it rather than, than the people without hematological malignancy. So I think that's it's not in isolation. It supports the, the data we know these individuals are at risk of infection. And so in t to answer the question about the impacts on patients, well, I think most patients, not all patients, but most patients are anxious about COVID. I mean, most people are anxious about COVID and they're anxious about, about their own situation with, the, the, with the, the disease and treatment affecting their risk. And in fact, most, most patients have, have locked down some of them even earlier than before the government said they should do, do so because it was an obvious risk mm. when we heard the discussions. And so that's been a challenge. Um, the shielding uh, list that came from the government was a bit of a challenge as well because some people were on it, some people weren't on it. Um, yeah, these, these aging, NA, aging NHS computers couldn't really do the job, could they? I think that was part of the problem. I, I, think, it's even the, 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 I think it's just that we don't have a list of patients with, yeah. who, who are vulnerable, and, and, they, and they had to sort of um, create this list in next to no time, which I think clearly is yeah. difficult with millions of people involved. 
So I think that was a big challenge. And I think now the challenge we're having is, is coming out of shielding. So, you know, clearly in the population, the prevalence of the virus is going down. Um, hopefully it will continue to go down, but we have the variables of, of the general population being, you know, the lockdown being relaxed, which we obviously then worry, is there going to be a second, one called second peak, but, uh, but a, a recurrent return of the first peak, if you like. And will that, and then that obviously puts our patients at risk again. So, so I think there's a lot of anxiety amongst our patients about coming out of shielding and mm. how that can be done. There's some people saying, "Well, it'll only be safe when there's no virus." Here. That's going to be a long time off, or other people taking a more possibly rational view that you know, okay, as it gets less, we can control we can control the risk in a better way. Um, mm. So I think um, it has created a challenge for the patients. It's also created a challenge for our treatment. So we we don't, don't want to bring patients into hospital. We haven't wanted to bring patients into hospital. So our patients are being by phone. Our treatments, have, if we could, we've delayed to, to stop them mm-hmm. having patients having to come to hospital. Um, we're now starting to, to, for patients where we feel we rate uncomfortable about delaying treatments that we're starting to retreat you know start the treatments again which i think is important uh, in the safer way safest way as we can you know um you know protecting the patients when they come to hospital um mm. but i think it has had a major impact C- can you talk a little bit about that protecting the patients thing because one of the big worries at the moment is everybody doesn't want to go to hospital and so there are people who probably should be in hospital who are staying at home um, and there are people not presenting with, with conditions to be diagnosed or reluctant to go even when they really should. And you mentioned there that sometimes you do need to treat people and, and you protect them. What, what, what's going on in hospitals? Because I guess it's very different. And many of us have not been in a hospital for months now. No, no, the longest time no. I've not been one for a while. No, I, think, I mean, I think the uh, impression and the, probably the reality initially was that, that the hospitals were dangerous places where, you, where the virus was focused. We, we and almost all the hospitals I've heard of in the UK um, effectively separated the wards and the, and the hospital into places where COVID patients would be and, and places where COVID patients were, which were, if you like, clean of COVID. Um, so in, you know, in our institution, we, our, our um, oncology wing, which includes hematology, was virtually free of COVID throughout the whole, the whole crisis, if you like, so far. Um, obviously, some of our patients came in with temperatures and may have had COVID, and they were then moved to the COVID ward. So, so there's been a, a, there's been a segregation of of people, and, and actually, as a hematologist, you know, in our centre, we weren't really allowed to go into the COVID areas because we you know for the fear of bringing it back to, to our patients. Um, so, you know, we wouldn't go into an ICU, for example, um, where obviously a lot of patients were focused. If you know, and obviously we have hematology patients there even before the COVID era, we would go on, there'd be a lot of family members there, a lot of hematologists would go on to see the patients. That's really been stopped to try and stop any risk of cross-contamination. So now when we see patients, uh, you know, we, we're isolating them as much as possible. So we're, we're distancing if we can, we're, we're, we're using them in, that, in, in single rooms. We're seeing far less patients still. So I mm-hmm. said, we, we may have seen 50 or 70 patients in the morning. We're now seeing maybe, 15 this week in, the, in that same pay and, and, and isolating the patients. Um, but we are thinking very carefully about it and trying to make it as safe as possible for patients. So I think the risk of to, to a patient coming into a controlled area like ours is very small. Um, yeah. I think yeah. the risk of going to A&E, you know, with a temperature is probably different. Yeah, I'm, I mean, that's a good point. And, and how, how would you handle it then, do you think? I mean, if let's say someone is shielding they've been shielding for 10 weeks um or more and you know they've been really strict about it everyone they're living with is strict about it or in some cases people have moved out of their house that means mm-hmm. they've left their family home in order to, to live somewhere safer yeah. um and so they know that they've not been exposed but maybe they start to get a temperature anyway and perhaps they've got symptoms that might suggest uh, that they've picked up a bacterial chest mm-hmm. infection because of course you can get that from what's in your own throat you mm-hmm. don't have to catch that from someone else Mm-hmm. Um, and they're, they're then very frightened to go into hospital and um, people are sort of saying to them, hey, go into hospital. Now, of course, one option is to try and treat early with an antibiotic and, uh, and, and keep them at home. But what mm-hmm. if it starts to get mm, a bit iffy? How, how would you talk to somebody in that situation? How would you try and make sure that you didn't bring them to hospital and then give them COVID on top? 
Well, I think well, there's, there's two issues. I think, first of all, that's a dangerous situation that we know um, some of our patients who are vulnerable will get serious infections anyway, as you said, and, and, and you know, managing it at home is not always possible. And in that situation, you know, the, the hospitals, we know we have a way of, of keeping those, those patients away from, from COVID. Now, I think it, what's, the second part of your question was, what's the risk of us giving someone COVID in, in, in the hospital? Yeah. I think, I think that is very small now in that controlled way because we know, we test patients. Anyone, anyone admitted to, to hospital is now tested for COVID. Um, you know, we're getting close to having, having uh, antibody tests and more testing generally. And mm. so, and we are segregating patients, you know, if they are positive now. You can never say for certain that someone's cleared of COVID. Um, yeah. And so, so, you know, the, the safest place to be is, is, is sitting in a room by yourself and not seeing anyone else. But that is the safest from COVID, but not the safest from, you know, other health issues. And so yeah. we, have to, we have to break down the, the, the shielding at some point. And the, yeah, and and especially if someone's ill like that. And I, I guess they would probably, if possible, be admitted to a side room or something or somewhere where they wouldn't be exposed to other people. Um, and, and they would try and shield them in the hospital, I guess. But yeah. I, um, think, I think generally across the board, you know, not just CLR, not just hematology, hmm. um, there, are, there, are going to, there are going to be patients who die because they are not um, prepared to come into hospital with heart attacks hmm. or strokes or other things because they're scared yeah. of COVID. So there's a balance there's a, that, that has to be that has to be met, met, met you know, arrived at. Um, to, hmm. to, get it, to get it proportionate, really. So, you know, um, so it's very important that to contact the special, your specialist, your specialist team, hmm. and that they know what, what the, they can assess the risk of coming in or not coming in. Yeah, and, and compare that to this other risk. I guess one of the problems with the whole COVID thing all the way through, though, is we, we don't really know what that risk is. So, um, you know, you hear, for example, um, figures like, oh, it's 1%. That will die and then you say well actually no that probably is too high for the general population but maybe that's too low for people with blood cancer you mentioned sort of two or three times but then the rate also goes up when you're old it also maybe goes up if you're a little bit fat and also and then to actually get a handle on how much of a risk you are at first of all if you catch it but second of all how much risk there is in you catching it i mean you know if you meet one person i, I heard recently that they think it's about one in 250 or one in 500 people or something now have it in the UK so if you meet one person you know it's perhaps not very likely that you'll catch it especially if you're social distance but if you meet 10 people 20 people I mean how do you weigh all that up and how do you help doc help your patients sorry um to actually evaluate risk because I think it's been a bit sort of just broad stroke at the moment and so therefore there's this kind of very fearful like stay at home was the right message in many ways and it still is in some ways for us I mean we're still shielding and no one's saying we shouldn't but but to actually be able to weigh up the risk and say, okay, yes, I understand I need to stay home, but I've also got this problem, so now I need to go to hospital, and that's more important. I mean, that's, that's difficult. Yeah, I think, I think in the gen, from a general shielding point of view and or, or isolating perspective, I mean, you know, there are certain environments where the risk of, of contracting the virus is, is much lower. So, so outside with social distancing, you know, it's far less, you know, with short, short interactions with people rather than, you know, spending a long time with them, you know, being stuck on the tube, not, not, not distancing is obviously very different to going for a walk in the Dales and, and not seeing anyone. And so I think um, our patients have to take some, you know, some responsibility for, for that. They, they know, you know, that you've got, to, you know, the risk of getting infected is, is, is really based on several things, isn't it? It's, it's, it's how many people in the, are in the community with the virus. So what's the chance of coming across somebody? And whether you're, and are you going to be exposed to uh, the patient? Um, uh, can we go, can we, uh, you know, are you going to expose them? Are you going to be close to them? Um, you know, are you going to be able to socially distance from them? So I think my view is that, that I want to know what's going on in the population. So, so the changes in distancing will, um, will have an impact on the prevalence of the virus. If the prevalence of the virus is going down, that I'm happier for my patients to start, you know, going out and doing a little bit more with the with the distancing, and then hmm. just be, you want to be a little bit ahead of the curve so that you want to know what's happening in the population before you actually, you know, the next thing's going to be 
know, you go and sit yeah. in, a, in a pub, in a garden, garden of a pub, and you know when they open up and things like that. So I think it's yeah. going to be a gradual release over time as the virus goes down. So um, you see, the thing is, a lot of us were expecting it to finish on the fifteenth of June, as though it was going to be a hard day. Yeah. And then there's been talk about, oh, it's the end of June. And then I think there's been a lot of talk about, actually, it may well be longer than that. What's your kind of gut feeling? It sounds like you're saying you, you don't expect shielding to stop overnight. Um, you, you think perhaps, you know, like this idea. I mean, for me, for example, I didn't go out for 10 weeks plus, more than that, actually. Um, and then they suddenly said it was OK to, to go for a walk. Um, but I didn't feel terribly comfortable going out in the afternoon into a busy park. So what, what did we do? We got up early. We went um, before most people were up, you know, a lot of kids, particularly young people, will be in bed. So even my sister actually was still in bed at the time we went out. And we didn't go at 6 a.m. like I've heard some people do. But we went out, you know, first thing in the morning when people were not around. We found a place that we knew had wide footpaths, yeah. uh, wide open spaces, not many people there, right. social distancing. But I have to say, it was quite worrying. I think maybe people aren't emphasizing enough the, the sort of, impact it has on someone to be isolated for 12 weeks through essentially through fear um and then to to build that fear and to almost become agoraphobic actually and so to actually gradually ease yourself in is probably going to be less anyway just psychologically let alone from the risk so have you had any thoughts about that is, is that something you get you've had many conversations with your patients yeah. about or well, well i'm an optimist okay so i think this this virus will will reducing prevalence and eventually, you know, will we'll disappear when we get vaccines and things that could be some time. Um, but what, what we have now, which we didn't have two months ago, is is a much better feel for uh, how much virus is around and where it, where is it. And so mm. as we get the track and tracing and all the you know, testing and you know, when that really kicks in, in, we'll be able to isolate the virus rather than isolate the people, if you like. And I think um, that's why we're going to be moving over the next next month or two. If you look at other countries, Spain, Italy, France, China, those other countries, um, where who are ahead of the curve for us, that the, the incidence, the prevalence of the virus has gone right down, and the, you know, the deaths have gone right down, and, and, every, and it, there doesn't seem to be a second spike. Um, if, for example, China, although we have to, we don't have other the data, the quality of the data. So I think that it's around, as you said, slowly. Uh, you know, but with the knowledge of what of, of what's going on in the community, um, going out and when it's safe, doing things that you know, as long as you're distant and you do the hand washing and you do all those other precautions, um, then you're not going to catch the virus on a walk. You know, walk where you don't meet anybody if you don't sit yeah. down and touch anything. And so, yeah. so and, and and you're right. There's a thing. There's a sort of um, you know, it's it's not healthy to be to be isolated inside for months and months and months. Uh, you know, you've got yeah. to, you know, we're not designed to do that, are we? So, so I think it's a matter yeah. of doing it logically, you know. So, I mean, I, I was talking to two different patients um, who over the weekend just gone uh, were told by their teams, um, I think trying to be helpful, but maybe not really, really being that helpful, that they, they would have to socially isolate and shield for two years. Uh, I don't know where this figure of two years came from, whether it's some kind of modelling or some kind of theory, but I mean, that was quite devastating for those people concerned and for everyone else on the forum, because we were, we were all going, well, is there something special about you? And there really wasn't. Um, I think they were post-treatment, so maybe that might make them a little bit special, but there's lots of people post-treatment. So, I mean, what's your sense um, of, of the timings on this? Do you, do you think, I mean, are you an optimist for the vaccine, for example? I mean, they, they did say that there are tens of millions of doses of the Oxford vaccine being made ready right now. And if it does show to be working, that they would give it in September and, and maybe even prioritise the shield, as they said. So well, what do you think about that? First of all, um, I think that the, the virus in the community will go down before the vaccine is, has any real impact, even if it's available in September. So, so I think the risk of it contracting the virus will be far less. I mean, um, mm -hmm. so I think we need to, to the vaccine is an important way to protect this the population not an individual as i would see it at the moment um obviously it does protect the individual um but um i think that the, the virus will be in a, in, in a much lower uh, frequency before the vaccine development the vaccine will hopefully prevent second pandemics which is you know next year whenever they come back um and that's very important um 
terms of the vaccines, you know, some certainly one of the Oxford vaccines is, is a live vaccine. So, so you know, we have to make sure that the vaccines that, that are appropriate for our patients, first yeah. of all, and secondly, we know our patients don't necessarily respond to vaccines as well as someone who doesn't have an immune mm. problem. So, more important than that, I mean, if we if you have a vaccination as a, as a patient with a dead vaccine and you respond, that's great, uh, but the real value of the vaccine is driving it out of the, out of the herd, if you like, to use the mm. and, uh, and yes. uh, not have it around for, for everybody else to catch. So, but what if you've got this situation where there's still a bit of virus around um, and, you know, there is a vaccine, and I think it's a bit debatable about this Oxford vaccine, isn't it? Because it's, it's sort of chimpanzee cold virus, essentially, that apparently can't cause disease in humans, but then they put the MRA in it so whether that is going to be a problem for for us to take or not is a bit unclear but you might well be right that it might not work for us so what happens then if you're if you're a patient and maybe you're you know you're quite low in your immunoglobulin levels mm -hmm. um but up until this point you haven't qualified for ivig or anything like that um do you think do you see a time when ivig might protect against covid and obviously not too soon but i think i think the reality is that the, the, that we will that the virus will will be driven out of the, the population and therefore you know will, will not cause a problem for our patients in the long medium to long term two years i think is is you know i, I would that was a very pessimistic view of okay. how people have to shield for and okay that, well that's really good so can we can we can we hold you to that peter that you know yeah. that we'll, we'll be home for christmas or something i don't know <laughs> Maybe. So, so not too good, but i think it's a matter of 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 patients being informed and making the right decisions um, mm -hmm. and sensible decisions. I mean, so, you know, I enjoy playing golf. I want to play golf. I, I can distance myself. I'm not going to get infection doing that. So, that's, you know, I can, make, I can make a judgment as to what the risk of me doing something and the benefit to me personally of doing it are. And I think it's really important mm -hmm. that, uh, that, that individual patients do that and don't take unnecessary risks. Um, yeah. And and each individual will have to assess what what's an unnecessary risk for them. But yeah. so I think I think the my being optimist, I think for the next you know weeks and maybe two or three months, we're going to have the virus is going to go drop down over time, and the risk is going to get less, and then we're going to start relaxing the shielding, um, at, you know, in that at that sort of time scale. Sure. And, and I guess then one of the interesting outcomes for all of this for some of us will be that perhaps we'll be a little bit more conscious about our risk in general. And so, like, for example, the flu season, I've talked to some patients who, who won't go on the London Underground during the winter, but they might be happy going on it in the summer. And that's a sort of individual risk assessment that they used to make uh, mm -hmm. because of things like flu and concerns about flu, which, again, vast majority of patients will be OK with flu, but some might get into trouble or have a long illness with it. And so... Do you think that there'll be perhaps a bit more awareness about infection and the need for vaccinating in more general terms for some people with blood cancers and, and just about how to try and make sure that as people's immunity gets worse? Because there's a, there is a whole group of people who are suffering regular infections at the moment, but mm -hmm. can't get IVIG because of rationing, um, can't, you know, maybe they're given antibiotics, maybe they're not, and that can be a bit debatable. Some mm -hmm. of them are told, yes, you ought to use your own towels and wash your hands more carefully. Others are told just live your life normally. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that we all create a bubble for ourselves, but it, do you think there are some things that even moving forwards, people with, with CLL and other blood cancers will do differently, perhaps? I think it'll vary between individuals, but I think um, we have to remember that, you know, we want to have as normal a life as possible. Yes. And, yes. Uh, you know, we don't want uh, our patients' lives to be defined by the fact that they're suffering from CLL. They want to have have you know be able to do what they want i mean think the big things for our patients are meeting the grandchildren meeting the you know same for everybody hey some of us don't have grandchildren yet peter come on yeah. come on remember there are some of us who've still got our children at home yeah you might want to meet them <laughs> so, well yeah so, i would like to meet them actually at the moment yeah i've not seen my older son since january so then that's that, that's yeah. affects my quality of life so so i think we have to take you know get it in perspective and and uh mm. you know um as we know, as the, risk, the disease is coming under control in the population, you know, make the right decisions for individual patients. So I think what you're saying to me in general from the, both of these interviews, and I guess I should probably let you go because I know you're a really busy man, um, is that 
you are an optimist, that you believe that the future is bright for people with, with certainly CLL, and, and, and I guess there's a similar story in some other blood cancers where you know treatments are coming on board that actually prolong life, in some cases cure, um, and, and certainly we can expect much longer lives than perhaps um, people in previous generations with the same condition would have had. Obviously, there's some variation in terms of how aggressive cancer can be and when exactly you need treatment. But actually, you know, we should look forward to a time of even more advance in treatment, but also a time when, you know, this COVID will eventually uh, get out of the way and we can get back to sort of trying to live a bit more of a normal life, maybe with some thoughts about infection. And, and I guess that's an area we, we will need to address in some people especially. Um, but to try and make sure, as you say, that, that, that it's about quality of life and, um, and, and living. I mean, because it's not much of a life, Peter, to be stuck up, cooped up in a house uh, mm -hmm. for month after month and not able to do anything. So we've got to find a way to get people out. And, mm -hmm. and there are some things that I wish people do. So, for example, what about anti-body uh, screening? So, you know, there's been a lot of anxiety where people have desperately tried to shield themselves away from family members who've got COVID. And and maybe even thought they might have got it themselves. So that anxiety might potentially go if you were to test the family and or the, the, the patient and say, oh, actually, there, is, there are antibodies here. And at least, you know, I know that might not 100% protect, but, you know, wouldn't it be nice? And yet, when it came to the rollout of the antigen testing, I'm afraid shielded patients weren't prioritised. So I'd kind of like to see that change. I don't know if it will or if, there's, if you've got any influence on that. <laughs> Well, I mean, the antibody tests are important, uh, but mm. um, you know, we have to understand once we get a test that it works, and we, there are mm. you know, relatively inexpensive, very inexpensive tests coming along for antibodies. Yeah. Um, we we need to understand how protective they are, and and, and yeah. that's you know that's you know we're in a very you know, we're learning a lot about this as we go along. So so I mean, I'm, I'm optimistic that. Um, that this will be a blip that we'll get that hopefully most of us will get through. I mean, obviously it's a big yeah. problem for many individuals, and I'm not I'm not un, I'm yeah. underplaying it, it. But you know, I think in in, in six months, a year's time, we'll, you know, we'll let, know a lot more. And we'll be through this this bubble, and uh, and hopefully, um, you know, we can get back onto to more normal lives. I mean, you know, mm. uh, you know, I think that's what we, what we should be aiming for. I think that's what everyone should be aiming for, and that's probably a great place to stop. And thank you very much, Peter, for all you've done over decades. And I never actually asked you how long, but mm -hmm. over decades of, of um, helping to drive forward the science in this and doing so in a compassionate way. Uh, and I hope that people who've been watching have, have learned something, but also caught something of your heart and your passion for this area and, uh, and just your optimism. I mean, I think that's, that's a, a wonderful thing to have because yeah and it's difficult because i and we don't want someone who's unreal but we also don't want to be kind of um what's the word fed a very negative story i mean it's, it's hard to get that balance right for a patient's point of view but thank you for what you do really appreciate it nice to meet you okay all right all the best thanks a lot peter okay. Bye. Bye.